Welcome to the Absite Smackdown podcast. We'll talk clinical scenarios, Absite facts, and interesting general surgery knowledge. Now, let's get to it. Hi. This talk is all about the abdominal wall, hernias, and mesh repair. From deep to superficial, one of the most important things to remember about the abdominal wall laterally. From deep to superficial, the abdominal wall spells tie, transverse abdominis, internal oblique, external oblique. Now, of course, there's peritoneum deeper than all of this, but an easy way to remember the musculature out laterally of the abdominal wall is the word tie. And that'll come up later uh, when we talk all about uh, the uh, arcuate line of Douglas. But just remember, lateral abdominal, anterior abdominal wall, tie, deep to superficial, transverse abdominis, internal oblique, external oblique. Campers and scarpa's fascia are superficial to the external oblique, and the peritoneum is deep to the transverse abdominis, just like we said. Campers is fatty tissue and is superficial to scarpa's. Scarpa's fascia is a deeper and more fibrous layer, like you can see at screen right. The arcuate line of Douglas, or the semicircular line of Douglas, is a result of how the muscle changes as you move down the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, it's really important, uh, the way a lot of review books write these facts, and a lot of even textbooks, is they'll say, beneath the arcuate line, this happens, and above the arcuate line, this happens with the muscle out here. The arcuate line is a manifestation of how the muscles change. It's not like something happens above and below it. The reason you see a line on the anterior abdominal wall as you move inferiorly is because of how the muscles change configuration. So let's talk a little bit about that and how the line is made. So above the level where you see a line, the internal oblique, that middle muscle and tie, splits and goes over, splits and goes over, the aponeurosis splits and goes over the rectus abdominis. You can see here. So you have one and a half layers of muscle. You have the external obliques layer, and you have the half of the internal oblique. And so superior to where you see this line, the internal oblique aponeurosis envelops the rectus abdominal muscle anteriorly and posteriorly. So you have one and a half layers anteriorly. Inferior to the arcuate line, the aponeurosis of the internal oblique, external oblique, and transverse abdominis all go over the rectus abdominal muscle anteriorly. So the difference, the key difference is really in the external oblique. Transverse abdominis uh, is a little bit uh, different, but the headline is the beneath the arcuate line, the uh, internal oblique actually is anterior to the rectus. So if you can imagine looking at that instead of in cross section, but looking at it straight on as you, uh, if you were to have all the skin and fat off the abdomen and all the other layers, you can imagine that you would see a line there because inferiorly, uh, more muscle and tendon, more tendon goes over, more aponeurosis, I should say, goes over the rectus abdominis. So it makes it look like a line because it's thicker. And then a superior to that, where you see the line, that's where the internal oblique splits and some of it go, the aponeurosis goes behind the rectus abdominis. Next, next, let's talk about specific umbilical her, uh, specific types of hernias, and we'll lead off here with umbilical hernias. Uh, childhood umbilical hernias are usually not repaired until approximately four years of age, and that's because they close on their own a lot. Now, risk factors for congenital umbilical hernias include being African American, prematurity. Risk factors for developing an umbilical hernia include female gender and any condition that causes intra-abdominal pressure, like pregnancy but also obesity, cirrhosis with ascites, and intra-abdominal mass also does this, but it's really important to understand that in cirrhotics with ascites, there are some special issues about umbilical hernias. The teaching and the board's question that comes up and the abscite sometimes is we don't fix umbilical hernias in cirrhotics. It's a, it is a general matter, of course, it's a trap. They get ascites leak via the wound. Even if you drain all the ascites out at the time of procedure, it recollects, it drains out later, it can put them into renal failure, it really tip them over the edge. Uh, and so cl classically, umbilical hernias and cirrhotics not to be repaired, with rare exception. There are some really unfortunate circumstances where you're going to have to fix it. There aren't many other good classic options. 
One of those is when there are ascites leaks already. The hernia has necrotic skin over it or something like that, and it's leaking. Or when there's necrotic skin, period, and it's going to leak. And then another time is if there's something incarcerated and strangulated. That's pretty rare. Uh, but again, necrosis of the skin in the area and existing ascites leak means that you kind of have to fix it. There are some times when there are alternatives being explored about injecting fiber and glue in these different things. Even if there's an ascites leak, it can stop it or at least temporize it. And that can be a nice uh, feature, but that's not really a classic review book teaching yet. The classic review book teaching is we don't fix um, umbilical hernias and cirrhotics with a rare exception uh, like we talked about. Necrotic skin, um, already having an ascites leak, uh, those are a key. Now, umbilical hernias in adults, these rarely close spontaneously. So in adults, they're not going anywhere. And they're due to a defect in the linea alba at the level of the umbilicus. We talked already a bunch about ascites, about umbilical hernias in patients with ascites, uh, you know, with cirrhotic patients. So we'll move on from that. The Absite Smackdown podcast now has a live review. Get your access for the only review conference that works best with your schedule. On call, can't travel, no time for an expensive hotel room or plane ticket, we've got you covered. Visit AbsiteSmackdown.com and select latest news to learn more and sign up today. Now there are many named hernias, and here are some of the classic ones. they are lumbar hernias. Spagillian hernias, some say Spagillian hernias, and epigastric hernias. Under lumbar hernias, there's a Groenfeld hernia. Groenfeld hernia passes through the superior lumbar triangle. And then there's a Petit's hernia. Petit's hernia occurs through the inferior lumbar triangle. It's bounded by the iliac crest, external oblique, and the lat. Um, Spagillian hernias, Spagillian hernias occur out laterally. Uh, they occur in the space lateral to the posterior rectus sheath uh, and um, along the medial portion of the transverse abdominis. But they kind of work their way through the muscle wall layers of the anterior abdominal wall. And you don't see these much unless patients are obese, maybe have a chronic cough with COPD. That's kind of where I've seen uh, the few that I've uh, had to take care of. Um, they're at a high risk of incarceration, about 20%, so you do have to fix those. The problem is they do tend to recur. Uh, these patients don't get better with their COPD or obesity or smoking or all of them, uh, typically. So they are at high risk for recurrence, and again, there's also a high risk of incarceration, so you do have to do it. It occurs through the linea semilunaris. Last on this slide is the epigastric hernia, and that occurs through the linea alba above the umbilicus. Well, this is a Meckel's diverticulum. You may remember from the pediatric surgery talk, uh, the ulcer occurs over this side. There's a, a anti -mesenter uh, the uh, mesenteric side. There's a rule of twos. The two types of gastric mucosa in them are gastric and pancreatic, most commonly seen. And the gastric can make the ulceration happen because it secretes gastric acid. And that happens over here. Typical teaching is to perform a resection of the area, not a wedge resection, although a wedge resection is an option. Uh, typically, people argue that since the ulcer's here, wedge resection of the meckles won't really fix it. It's, uh, as you know, due to a failure to close the enteric duct, and these can be connected to the umbilicus. And so a Latre's hernia is a hernia that contains a meckles diverticulum. Very rarely, these can be dangerous because bowel can herniate, uh, if this is connected to the umbilicus, up under up under the space around it can create a problem for the rest of the bowel. But a Latre's hernia is a hernia that it contains a meckles, a rare type of hernia. Another type is an amiant hernia, and that's a hernia that contains appendix. A pantaloon hernia is the one that's named that way because it looks like pants. And we'll get to more on inguinal hernias as we go along, but this occurs when you have an inguinal hernia that has a both direct and indirect component that's restricted by the epigastric vessels. This will make more sense when we get to the triangles slide later, triangles of in, in, inguinal hernia repair. But the headline here is a pantaloon is both a direct and indirect going over the uh, kind of tethered by the epigastric vessel. So if you can imagine, that would look like a pair of pants. Uh, and it's similar in appearance, like we said, to a pair of pants. 
Hey guys, it's me, Jess, your host of AppSite Smackdown Podcast. We have an AppSite study conference coming up January 8th, 9th, and 10th, just in time for that AppSite test. No travel is required. You can watch it from anywhere. It is being recorded, so you can watch it again or walk away and come back. You can buy tickets at www.appsitesmackdown.com. If you purchase before January, you get free merch. Also, with the purchase of a ticket, discount on a lot of our products. So don't forget, hashtag AppSite Smackdown. Obdurator hernia is one you really have to be on the lookout for because it's not always obvious. And so, of course, it's tested to make sure we know. Uh, this is seen in the elderly woman. It's associated with hauschip romberg sign, which is pain at the inner thigh with medial rotation. Bowel obstruction and a medial palpable thigh mass can be seen. And this occurs through the obdurator foramen. And so it's medial to and anterior to the obdurator nerve and vessels. And the problem is you may not see anything. You typically don't. On the outside, there may not be any visible hernia, just hauschip romberg sign, maybe a bowel obstruction. Elderly patient, because they're the, ones who, they're the ones who get this, so they have lots of comorbidities. This can be a tough one to figure out. Uh, you often end up just seeing it on CT. Tough one. Richter's hernia is another type, and that's a problem because you may have bowel perforation without obstruction. That occurs when there's only one portion of the bowel wall in a hernia, just the often anti-mesenteric side, and it becomes ischemic and necrotic. It dies off and you have a bowel perforation, even though the rest of the bowel isn't even in the hernia. Well, screen left shows an incisional hernia, and risk factors here include increasing age, wound infection post-op because things dehisted, you didn't quite see it maybe, or things opened up, uh, poor nutrition, or things just weakened, I should say, it's not always an associated dehiscence. Poor nutrition, tobacco use, corticosteroid usage. Corticosteroids, this will come up again, cause difficulties healing, as you know. Sometimes they're a necessary evil, but they can make things tougher. Just remember vitamin A antagonizes the wound healing effects of corticosteroids. Emergent repair, poor closure technique, and immunosuppression, the way wounds heal, as you remember, in part is cell-mediated. Macrophages are probably the key part of wound healing, but uh, T cells and, every, and many other cell types do play a, a role, and so immunosuppression is definitely a risk factor for incisional hernia. It's usually seen in the first post-op year. 10 to 20% of patients who have an abdominal procedure will end up with a hernia. There's a bulge noted on exam, and it may be painful or painless. It may have an incarcerated structure or none. Just because a structure is uh, stuck in an area, incarcerated, jailed, uh, doesn't mean that it's necessarily strangulated, especially when hernias are very large or large fascial aperture, but it can be really tough to tell. Uh, primary repair is associated with a greater recurrence. So the downside of just repairing things primarily, getting back to good fascia, is greater recurrence rate than with the mesh repair, because even though you try to do a tension-free repair, there still may be some. People add in all kinds of options uh, to avoid using mesh, and we'll talk about why. They can do component separations that allow the abdominal wall to be brought over more easily, uh, and that's something that I do with patients who used to have an open abdomen. But the point is, primary repair in general is associated with a greater recurrence rate than a mesh repair. However, some patients can't have a mesh repair for some reasons we'll talk about later, uh, and mesh repair does have its own risks, like wound infection and mesh infection. There are multiple approaches for repair for incisional hernias. Next, let's talk about hernias in the groin, and we'll first start by talking about inguinal hernia anatomy. Let's talk about the superficial ring initially. That's from the external oblique. So this is a way, and we'll kind of focus on the male for some of this, uh, but this is, imagine the way that the testis work their way uh, kind of down out of the abdomen, and as the body grew around it, they were transmitted through the layers of the abdominal wall. If you can do that, this will make more sense. Um, and through the deep ring, the deep ring is that deepest layer. It's the deepest defect or natural occurring defect in the transversalis uh, muscle. That's sort of the entrance to this uh, inguinal region, um, the inguinal canal. So a testis kind of passed through that area uh, of the transversalis and entered uh, what would become the inguinal canal. Uh, the external ring, like we said, is sort of the way out. That's the external oblique. And the external oblique has this superficial ring where the test has kind of worked its way out there. Then these ligaments have many 
many different names. Different regions of similar ligaments have different names. We'll go through most of the highlights, but that's what makes this area mostly complex. It's not the doing of it or seeing it really in the OR. When you see it, it actually makes it a lot easier when you've repaired a lot of these. When you read about it in a book, it's kind of tough. Gimbernet's ligament, or the lacunar ligament, is the portion of the inguinal ligament that joins the inguinal ligament to the pubic tubercle at the pectineal line. So where this inguinal ligament kind of folds back on itself, it's Gimbernet's lacunar ligament because it looks like a half moon. Uh, and then there's Poupart's inguinal ligament. Poupart's is the inguinal ligament, what we typically think of it as. And by the way, obviously, once again, we've rotated the cartoon here, so it looks like you're operating on the patient's right side. This is how it looks in the OR. Kind of helps you understand where everything is a little bit more for the anatomy. The iliopubic tract arises from the pectineal line and deep to the inguinal ligament. And so there's Cooper's pectineal ligament. That's from the thickening of the pectineal line and extends from the lacunar ligament. So that's down in here where you can see when the uh, cord is not there, or the spermatic cord is not there. Um, it makes more sense. Um, the conjoint tendon arises from the internal oblique, so the middle layer, and the transverse abdominis coming together. It's a conjoint region, some people call it, because it's not always a well-formed ligament. So you can see here just how close the femoral vasculature is to where we're working. If you didn't notice it in the last slide, it is really right on top of where you're working. There's the vein and the artery. Classic teaching is during repair, if you place a suture and you, um, and you do see some significant bleeding, uh, usually you're using something non-resorbable at this point, uh, like a proline, or if you are using a PDS, um, a PDS uh, suture, typical for repairs, um, you don't remove the suture. You, uh, you may see just slight bleeding. You leave the suture in place and hold pressure. You very rarely have you actually gone through the femoral vein. You may have just skived it. Um, but the headline is uh, you do not remove the suture. Uh, you just gently hold pressure and it gets better. We'll talk about avoiding the femoral vessels, which is really the key to this. But they are really right on top of where you're working sometimes, especially as you work lower in the inguinal region. The Absite Smackdown Podcast. Visit the Smackdown at AbsiteSmackdown.com. Let's talk about femoral hernias. These occur in the femoral space. You remember it's in general in the right groin, nerve, artery, vein, empty space, this one, and then lymphatics. It spells navel. Femoral hernias occur into that space, and 15% are actually bilateral. Although they're more commonly seen in women than they are in men, it's important, and this comes up all the time, that indirect inguinal hernia is still the most common in women, and it's the most common in men. Indirect is the most common, and uh, femoral moves up on the list in women, but it's still not number one. There's a higher risk of incarceration and strangulation here than an inguinal hernia because the hernia orifice, the neck, tends to be more narrow. Exam may demonstrate a bulge at the upper medial thigh and inferior to the inguinal ligament. Operative repair? Yeah, you got to fix them because they're at high risk for incarceration. A McVeigh repair that we'll talk about is typically performed, kind of showing that here, suturing down, it closes off that area. Uh, if strangulation is present, like I said, you got to do an emergent repair. And when the McVeigh is part of the McVeigh repair, the lateral boundary is the femoral vein, medial is the lacunar ligament, anterior is the inguinal ligament, posterior is Cooper's ligament, and you may need to divide the inguinal ligament to reduce the bowel. That does happen. Um, the key with this is you're obviously not placing any suture into the lateral boundary. Uh, the lateral most uh, area has femoral vein in it, even if you don't see it. That's for most femoral hernia repairs. The question will come up with any repair. Where do you not approximate uh, the mesh or whatever you may do? Typically, the vein lives laterally. Medially, there's really not much to stitch to, but you don't put sutures to that lateral side. If you can help it, that's where the vessels really do live. Well, in just a second, we're going to show you for this. Uh, here are the epigastric vessels, anterior, posterior. You're looking down a laparoscope, and you're transperitoneal uh, here. You've opened the peritoneum, gotten in the abdomen, patient's head down. Uh, this is uh, You'll put the left side down to work on this right side. And retsius's space is the preperitoneal space behind the pubis. It's up here. 
uh, laparoscopic hernia repairs get into Retzius' space. So a laparoscopic hernia repair, if you do it preperitoneal, you can open this peritoneum. This is if you're transperitoneal, you're in the peritoneum. You can open this, dissect it down, you're in Retzius' space. Or you can enter and never actually get pre-per uh, intraperitoneal. You cannot divide the peritoneum. And then you'll see a slightly more fat-covered version of this, uh, and the CO2 will do a lot of the dissection. Um, and you, you will be in Retzius' space, uh, in this pre-peritoneal space in the area. Hesselbach's triangle is another important anatomic landmark. That's created by the uh, inguinal ligament inferiorly. Let's go back to this one to show it. The inguinal ligament inferiorly, the epigastric vessels laterally, and the rectus sheath medially. So here, that's Hesselbach's triangle. A direct hernia that goes through the floor of this area will have to go through Hesselbach's triangle. It's a consequence of it. An indirect hernia will kind of squeeze down the inguinal canal and actually doesn't go through Hesselbach's triangle because it actually passes down the inguinal ligament into the, it goes into the inguinal canal down along the inguinal ligament. So it's not going through Hesselbach's triangle. Now the contents of the inguinal canal include in women the round ligament or the spermatocord in men with the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. That'll come up again. The cremaster muscle, vas deferens, testicular artery, pampiniform venous plexus, and the ilioinguinal nerve that's superior to the cord and you try to preserve that. Uh, all the nerves, and that one especially. So here's that external inguinal ring. There's the internal. Uh, and let's talk more about inguinal hernias in general. It's the most common type of hernia. About 50% are indirect, 25% are direct, and about 25% are both, whether they actually look like pantaloons or not. About 25%, if you really look for it, have a defect in both the floor and a defect coming through that internal ring. Much more common in men, right side, more common than left. Heavy exercise, ascites, any condition that increases intra-abdominal pressure, that is a risk factor. Indirect hernia results from a patent processus vaginalis, and like we said, it rises lateral to Hesselbach's triangle. Processus vaginalis is the um, uh, kind of peritoneum continuation, uh, from tunica, it's uh, related to the tunica vaginalis, but basically, vaginalis, vagina kind of means blind sac in Latin. And it is a blind sac. It's a sac that the test is kind of pushed through and down as it rotated through here in a layer that it picked up. So to have a processus vaginalis that's uh, patent um, is uh, uh, means open, of course. And so the bottom line is a patent, an open processus vaginalis, is how the hernia kind of makes its way out. In order to have an in indirect inguinal hernia, you have to have an open processus vaginalis because it's the covering uh, of this uh, area that kind of gets carried into the um, deep ring. Pr protrusion of the abdominal contents through the internal ring is what we're talking about here, and the hernia sac is anteromedial to the cord. So you'll, as part of your repair, you'll open the external oblique, the uh, which eventually makes the inguinal ligament. But you'll open the external oblique, you'll reflect the nerve out of the way, you'll uh, um, distract the cord, uh, put it around your finger, and you'll dissect, and, as you, and you will find this patent processus vaginalis. Uh, you'll perform a high ligation on it for these inguinal, indirect inguinal hernias. So the hernia sac is always anteromedial, anteromedial to the cord, but it's all covered with everything, and you can't tell right away. But that's usually where it is, anteromedial. Now, a direct hernia passes through weakness in the transversalis fascia. Sure does. It passes, that's the floor of the inguinal area. Like we said, the layers of the belly wall, transverse abdominis, internal oblique, external oblique. So yeah, the floor is the transverse abdominis. So to get out, sure, the, directly, it's got to pass through a weakness in that. It protrudes directly, like we said, through Hesselbach's triangle. It has to. Hesselbach's triangle includes the musculature of the abdominal wall out there. And in order to get out directly without going through the side door, this open area from uh, growth and development, it has to go through that muscle. That's the only way it can get out. And quote, a sliding hernia, unquote, is a term given to inguinal hernias where you have abdominal contents that kind of slid down into the hernia, like cecum ovary appendix. 
We'll talk about open repair and when to do a primary repair. We'll talk more about this in just a, mit, a bit, including the nerves that we first talk about here. Um, this is lateral, this is medial, this is the patient's right side. Uh, we have here the ilioinguinal nerve distracted out of the way. You'll see that as you open the external oblique. Here we have the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. And you'll see the cord is distracted to the side and we've stitched mesh in to recreate the floor. Now an open repair, a primary repair for incarceration and strangulation requires emergent repair, typically open, but not always. Uh, typically requires open repair. Uh, people often think that mesh is at a higher risk of infection for that. Uh, so if they try to, they may often elect a primary repair in that circumstance if possible. Um, nerves in the inguinal region and associated lumbar levels, this will come up and it will come up again even in this talk. The genitofemoral nerve is from L1, L2, iliohypogastric, not seen here, T12 and L1, and ilioinguinal from L1. That one's the one you sort of see on the way in there. Late hernia recurrences are felt to be caused by loss of fascial strength, and early recurrences are felt to be due to in inadequate repair. This will come up again, but just remember, uh, inadequate repair, early recurrence. We'll talk about repair techniques in the next couple slides. The transabdominal preperitoneal repair. It's where you get into the belly, but you don't open the peritoneum and you get in that space of retzius and do your case. And then the totally extra peritoneal repair. Um, oh, I should say, let me, let me, let me redo it. Transabdominal, uh, you'll enter the abdomen, uh, visualize the area. You may then open the peritoneum, you do, over this area, dissect it down. You're getting into retzius space. You're doing a pre-peritoneal dissection, but you've gone into the abdomen first. This is actually typically the one I do when I do them laparoscopically. Uh, so you're transabdominal, you're in the abdomen, uh, you're in the peritoneum, and then you will uh, dissect it free from the area and then reapproximate at the end. But then there's a totally extra peritoneal approach where you never get into the abdomen uh, completely. You stay extra peritoneal and you'll utilize the gas and blunt dissection to uh, safely dissect the area. Um, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair should really be considered when inguinal hernia repair is uh, uh, proposed in, a, in the case of bilateral hernia repairs. You can do it with a scope in the same spot, saves them incisions on both sides. It's really a good option for those people. Um, also, it's a good for uh, if you need a redo repair. Um, if, if the first one was open, good to do the second one laparoscopically, get you in a new place. Uh, care is taken, like we said, to avoid uh, sutures near the vein, but another important place where we don't place sutures is in the pubic tubercle area. Uh, that'll cause osteitis and pain, so me very medially. We'll show that again. Um, the different repairs, we talked about some of these. Uh, the Bassini repair includes an inguinal floor reconstruction with approximation of the transversalis fascia, shelving edge of the ligament, and conjoined tendon. High ligation of the sac is performed, no mesh. Shuldice is primary repair using a running suture, and you reconstruct the floor kind of by using uh, the different muscles to make a layer. This is actually really a uh, good repair to use um, uh, when you just want to use a suture in the area. No mesh again, uses patient, all the patient's own tissue. There's a high ligation of the sac. This is actually the primary repair that I do. Uh, McVeigh repair is a primary repair where the closure involves Cooper's ligament. It's a primary repair. It can fix femoral hernias too. The Nias repair is one especially for femoral hernias. It is a posterior preperitoneal repair, and the iliopubic tract gets approximated, uh, Cooper's ligament gets approximated to it. And then we'll talk about open repair with mesh. Again, avoid prosthetic mesh if there's an infection present or they're high risk. Uh, it, just a lot of downside for it. And a Lichtenstein repair involves mesh reconstruction of the inguinal floor like we're doing here. Patient's right side again, uh, lateral, medial, inferior, superior. Cord distracted out of the way. Lichtenstein repair is utilizing mesh to reconstruct the floor of the region. The external oblique is here reflected laterally. It's been opened already to get to the cord. The Absite Smackdown podcast is based on the best-selling review book, Absite Smackdown. The only Absite review with an entire video review course included. Visit AbsiteSmackdown.com and pick it up today. 
Another important technical consideration is when you repair an inguinal hernia in a child. Uh, for patients in whom you know a bilateral inguinal hernia is suspected, we explore the contralateral side. Uh, this is a classic pediatric surgical uh, issue. When one side has an inguinal hernia, they often both do. So uh, often uh, many advocate exploring both sides. In children, high ligation of the hernia sac is sufficient repair because they typically have an indirect inguinal hernia and that's it. Uh, you may look to see if they have more, but in general, since they have indirect inguinal hernias, uh, owing to the fact that uh, in that age group, uh, you know, you can imagine with growth and development, the one you're going to see, because they still have very strong new um, abdominal wall musculature, the one you're going to see is the one that kind of sneaks out the side uh, and developmentally speaking uh, makes sense. It's going to go through the internal or deep ring, and that's going to be an indirect hernia. So here is the cord distracted with the Penrose drain and the sac grasped, and they're dissecting the sac away from the cord back toward the deep ring. Let's talk about some specific hernia types and issues with respect to them that come up a lot. We've talked about some of these already. Ventral or umbilical hernias. Like we said, less than three or four centimeters can be repaired primarily. Defects over four centimeters in general nowadays should be repaired with mesh. You can do this open or laparoscopically, and each has advantages and disadvantages. Laparoscopic repair, decreased length of stay, reduced recurrence rate, less difficult in obese patients with smaller hernias, some say fewer overall complications, and that's the classic now. Disadvantages, takes longer, higher costs, more technically demanding. Open, advantages are shorter OR time, decreased cost, appropriate in patients that can't tolerate insufflation. Disadvantages, increased risk of recurrence, increased risk of complication rate, and here's one now. Groin hernias, you can also repair those open or laparoscopically. Again, um, fac uh, facilitate bilateral repair if you do it laparoscopically, and can, uh, it's also good to repair a recurrence of an open hernia this way. Less chronic pain and downtime. Disadvantages, uh, difficult in patients who have had previous preperitoneal surgery because that area is stuck. So prostatectomy, et cetera, retius, the space won't open. And you can't use that in patients who can't tolerate insufflation. Open has disadvantages too, uh, lower recurrence rates, uh, rather open has advantages, uh, tend to have lower um, recurrence rates, open costs, uh, lower costs rather, and shorter OR times. Uh, disadvantages, it tends to be more painful. Uh, the incision's much larger, so the incisional morbidity can be an issue, longer downtime for the patient. We mentioned in pediatric surgery uh, special considerations when you go to do these, so we talked about that already on the last slide. This slide is super useful. Uh, this comes up all the time, not just on Absite, but in real world practice. Uh, this is a view down the right inguinal area. And I want you to understand here we have the vas, here we have the spermatic vessels, and here we have the epigastrics, and they make a Y. Around this Y are these key triangles for hernia repair. You'll hear it called the five triangles. The D is for the direct space. If you have a direct hernia, it's got to go directly through the abdominal wall musculature. And so Hesselbach's triangles up here, epigastric vessels, inguinal, here. So a lot of triangles when it comes to hernias. But D is the direct space. If a hernia goes directly out, it's going through there. Here's another triangle on this side of the epigastric. That's the space for an indirect inguinal hernia. It's where you'll see it go along the spermatic cord, kind of go up that way. Uh, that's an indirect inguinal hernia, lateral to the epigastric vessels. Inferiorly, well, this is where a lot of the action is. F is if a hernia goes through here, it's going out as a femoral hernia. But then these are the two triangles we're going to really focus on here. The triangle of doom and the triangle of pain. In the triangle of doom live the femoral vessels. You can see that on the cartoon at the bottom. Lurking under here are the femoral vessels. Don't tack mesh to it. Don't tack mesh to it. Don't tack mesh to it. Don't suture to it. Vessels. Triangle of pain is out here. Putting a uh, tack in there or a suture uh, often causes chronic pain uh, because in the triangle of pain live many of the nerves. The gonadal vessels are medial. We talked about that, spermatic vessels. Illopubic tract, superiorly. Pelvic sidewall, inferior laterally. And the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and the genofemoral nerve, they're in that area, they're lurking. Uh, just careful, don't 
don't tack. Um, triangle of doom is the vasculature, like we said. Vas deferens medially, gonadal vessels laterally, inguinal ligament superiorly, sure, uh, and that's the triangle of doom. Um, the external iliac vessels, like we said, they run in there, so watch out. Tacking sutures in those areas, as we said, should be avoided to prevent vascular damage and also chronic pain. Let's talk about mesh repairs now. We talked a lot about different open repairs with Lipicini, McVeigh, Schuldice. Let's talk about mesh. The Lichtenstein repair is a tension-free standard for open repair. This is where mesh is utilized as we showed in that previous cartoon to reconstruct the floor. And mesh is sutured to the pubic tubercle medially, superiorly gets the rectus abdominis, internal oblique, transverse abdominis, and inferiorly gets the iliopubic tract slash inguinal ligament. And you actually pass the cord through that mesh as we showed in the other cartoon. You can also include resection of the ilioinguinal nerve. The ilioinguinal nerve may be sacrificed during hernia repair, and that can decrease incidence of chronic groin pain after repair because it makes it uh, not painful in the area anymore. And so some actually recommend, especially for reduced, sacrificing the nerve. That one can be sacrificed. Another option for mesh repair for different hernias is the component separation and a mesh underlay. You don't always have to add a mesh underlay, but component separation uh, or add an onlay. Component separation is incision in the external oblique and it's made one centimeter lateral to the rectus sheath. It's easier to see laparoscopically. It doesn't take long to do laparoscopically. But if you incise that external oblique, uh, the external oblique aponeurosis is then separated from the internal oblique and you can get medial mobilization of the rectus sheath laparoscopically up to four centimeters, open up to 10 centimeters or so total. Uh, four per side laparoscopically, so that's eight total. Um, so it can really help cover large defects or add a nice uh, tension relief component to them. It's very useful uh, and um, just a useful technique. Reeves stopa repair, that's for recurrent groin, abdominal, incisional, bilateral, or high recurrence risk hernias. This is preperitoneal. You take a large synthetic mesh and you utilize that to reinforce or replace the transversalis fascia. The transverse abdominus release is a posterior component separation and retro rectus mesh placement. Posterior rectus sheath gets mobilized. It gets excised laterally to allow dividing the transversus. Posterior sheath is then reapproximated and closed. And mesh is placed in the retromuscular space. The anterior rectus sheath is then closed. It's kind of an interesting repair. Complications of repair, well, we talked about some. And there are some key ones to know about that come up. One is recurrence. Early recurrences are likely due to technical errors or inadequate repair. Late ones are loss of fascial strength. Lots of risk factors for recurrence. Lifestyle ones like smoking and obesity. Comorbidities, diabetes, COPD, BPH, chronic constipation, malnutrition. Chronic steroid use, which remember can be antagonized by vitamin A. Vitamin A can help with that. All, basically all modifiable risk factors really should be addressed before you fix a hernia electively. If they need to lose weight, they need to lose weight. It's don't sacrifice the repair is the teaching uh, for uh, the fact that they didn't have their lifestyle modified because it's more of a pain for them and a bad outcome for you if they just recur after your repair. Smoking cessation more than four weeks, nutritional supplementation, all key. Urinary retention is the most common cause of complication after hernia repair, especially inguinal hernia repair, especially bilateral inguinal hernia repair. In an older guy, they tend to get uh, urinary retention, often need Foley catheters, etc. Typically, they have some BPH with it, uh, and uh, that predisposes them to it. Wound infection is another complication. Mesh infections are problematic, and people discuss how to treat those all the time. Uh, ischemic orchitis and testicular atrophy because of thrombosis of spermatic vessels, and disejaculation, constriction of the vas deferens. Nerve injury is another big problem, and here are those nerves again that we talked about earlier. These come up all the time. The iliohypogastric, T12 and L1, ilioinguinal, L1, genitofemoral, L1, and L2. The iliohypogastric pierces the transverse abdominis near the iliac crest. Then it pierces the internal oblique and travels beneath the external oblique, emerging from the superior cruse of the external inguinal ring. 
Injury, it gives loss of sensation to the lower abdomen and inguinal area. The ilioinguinal nerve from L1, that course is parallel to iliohypogastric, but it gets close to the inguinal ligament uh, with the spermatic cord that runs with it to emerge from the external inguinal ring. Injury includes loss of cremasteric reflex and sensation of the penis, scrotum, and medial thigh, and unfortunately sometimes pain. That's very difficult. Usually it's due to a compression, if there's pain, compression of the ilioinguinal nerve. If you put lidocaine up at the anterior superior iliac spine where the nerve comes through and they get better, that can be diagnostic and therapeutic to help them. Genitofemoral nerve, L1 and L2, that courses inferiorly along the psoas muscle. It divides into the general, genital and femoral branches. Genital branch enters the internal ring of the inguinal canal. The femoral branch courses with the iliac vessels to exit the femoral canal. Injury of the genital branch, loss of sensation and cremasteric motor function. Femoral branch injury gives insensate upper lateral thigh. This comes up all the time. Insensate upper lateral thigh from the femoral branch. And if you place staples or tacking mesh, uh, you tack mesh to the area uh, and below the iliopubic tract, like I said, you may injure the lateral cutaneous femoral branch of the genitofemoral or femoral nerves. And that's the, like we said, triangle of pain. That's it. That's the talk for uh, all about hernias and mesh and the abdominal wall for the abscite. Uh, remember, in a, in a contaminated field, in general, the answer is primary repair. That's the classic abside answer. We've walked through a lot of stuff, everything from steroids being antagonized by vitamin A in terms of wound healing if, uh, issues uh, to classic repairs like the Lichtenstein repair and others. These come up all the time on the abside, and facts about hernias and issues with hernia repairs really do come up routinely in practice as well as on our exam. So with that, this one is one of the more useful uh, talks that we have. I hope you found it uh, great for your review. And like we always say at the close, you have lots of ways to continue to get this content for ongoing review. There are plenty available and they're available all around online. Daily.absite.fact on Instagram. Can't say enough about the team has done a great job. Uh, Project Smackdown team shares one fact every day tells you when the new podcasts come out, and really helps you review on an ongoing basis while you're on social media. Facebook, at Absite Smackdown. Twitter, at Absite Smackdown. LinkedIn, there's an at Absite Smackdown page, which also shares the daily fact. And YouTube has the Absite Smackdown channel with the video podcast, uh, where you can hear us talk all about uh, classic cases and uh, different issues related to uh, creating Absite Smackdown for you, uh, the Absite certain useful study tips, uh, and on and on. So take a look there. And then, of course, the Absite Smackdown podcast available on YouTube uh, is a video form, but also audio on Amazon, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many others. So with that, I hope you found this one useful, like we said. And now let's get to the next one. Let's get to it. Thanks for listening to the Absite Smackdown podcast. Visit us at absitesmackdown.com for more great Absite facts.